right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for joining us for a conversation on Lexington's Opportunity Zones. Uh, my name is Anissa Franklin. I'm with the Urban League of Lexington Fayette County, where PG People Senior serves as our president and CEO. Uh, for working on the Opportunity Zones, we have partnered with the city as well as EHI consultants uh, to take a look at what Opportunity Zones look like in our community. So um, I'm going to ask that we stop sharing the screen for just a moment so that I can introduce uh, some of our partners on this effort. Uh, the first, um, and I'll just ask them to wave, um, that first is Ed Holmes. As I said last time, he is the E and the H in EHI. <laughs> he gave you a brief wave there. And then we also have Rob Monsma, who's also with EHI. Rob? And Rob will be uh, talking to us a little bit about the community profiles as we go through. And as we get started, um, you know, of course, one of our major uh, partners is the city of Lexington. So I want to invite uh, first Kevin Atkins as well as Elodie Dickinson to give us a few words of greetings and then we'll dive in. Kevin. Thanks, Anissa. Elodie, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? afternoon, everyone. My name is Elodie Dickinson, and I'm the Director of Workforce and Business Engagement for the City of Lexington. Um, we first started, we first heard about Opportunity Zones in 2018, and here we are in 2022. <laughs> nice to meet everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Elodie. And Elodie's the one that really put all the data together originally on this so we could move it to the state level to get the uh, get the approval. So she has really done uh, the yeoman's work up front before we turned it over. I'm Kevin Atkins. I'm the chief development officer for the city of Lexington. And, you know, Elodie and I are both really excited to be here today and help kick off this discussion about the Opportunity Zone program. So we're in year two of our partnership with Anissa and Ed and their teams uh, to really put some focus and put some intention, intentionality behind our Opportunity Zone efforts. So what we initially asked the Urban League and EHI to do as part of our economic development team, which we very much consider them to be, is uh, really work on the Opportunity Zone, assist with the promotion of the zone so that they could work with the neighborhoods, the businesses, and the whole development community toward that purpose. Encourage people to use uh, the community benefit agreements for new developments in the area. So that way this effort is um, focused on the development community and the residents working together. So we can grow jobs, careers, and improve quality of life all in the zone at the same time. And we also wanted to make sure that this effort, it was done in coordination with the work and the recommendation of the Neighborhoods and Transition Task Force, which wrapped up its uh, initial recommendations about a year ago, but that, that these two would move in concert, they would not be separate efforts. And I think that's one of the great things that's been accomplished here. So as part of the work of both EHI and the Urban League, uh, there's been a, uh, a guidebook created for the Opportunity Zone. And it takes a look at some of the benefits at the federal level, uh, since this is essentially a federal program, such as the, the tax benefits, deferral of capital gains, for example. The guidebook also provides the zone area so you can see exactly the boundaries we're talking about. So our partners, they put a lot of effort into this. It's a, and they provide great resource to anyone looking at our zone. And we just hope that you don't hesitate to reach out to them. But we also want you to, to talk to them if you get into the Opportunity Zone uh, process so that we know that there's an Opportunity Zone uh, investment being made within our specific zone. And, and we can take a look at how to, to assist you and, and help that process along as well. So just thank all of you for being here today. Uh, big, big thanks to Ed and Rob and Anissa for all their work on, on this project. Couldn't We wouldn't be here without them. Uh, so just thank you and Anissa, back to you. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, we definitely appreciate the opportunity to work with the city in this regard. So if we could, Rob, go ahead and share screen again. I would just wanna go over how we're gonna walk through our uh, time of conversation this afternoon. First, uh, with the agenda, we'll go from a welcome and meeting guidelines and things like that that we've already kind of started. We'll also do the greetings from the city, which you've already heard. 
Then we'll move into what is an opportunity zone, where are they in Lexington, and what do those community profiles look like? Then we'll also uh, talk about community benefits agreements, which is one of the things that Kevin just mentioned. Then we'll go into questions that you may have that hopefully we can answer, and if we can't, we'll find an answer for you. And then we'll go into the closing. So we've already had the welcome and things like that. So as far as meeting guidelines, of course, we would love to see all of your faces, but I understand it is lunchtime mm -hmm. and uh, nobody ever wants to sit and, you know, be eating in front of people. So, you know, keep your cameras off for that. But when we do come back and we're looking at everyone who is in attendance, we do ask that you would turn on your camera so we can kind of be more familiar with who you are. And then we also ask that you be mindful if you're using your microphone that we don't hear a lot of background noise. So kind of be cognizant of the things that are going on around you that we can see through your camera as well as what we can hear when you do speak, because uh, there will be a lot of opportunity for that. All right, moving on. Um, well, you see those different things there on the screen. So just please be mindful of those. And so now I want to ask uh, Rob if he would take it from here and talk to us about, you know, what the heck is an opportunity zone? Rob? Sure thing, Anissa. Thanks for teeing it up for me. Um, so opportunity zones um, were a program made, uh, created by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Um, so it's a uh, low income census tract that has been nominated by the state governor and certified by the Treasury Department. Um, opportunity zones uh, stand poised to receive a huge influx of investment, uh, given the enormous tax incent incentives that the new legislation uh, created. Um, so there are seven opportunity zones in Lexington. They're mostly located in the urban core. Um, but they do stretch out as far north as um, New Circle Road. Um, they mostly center on, on downtown and, and the surrounding areas. So opportunity zones have a function in a couple different ways. Um, first, there was a period of where investors could move um, their capital gains taxes into um, a qualified opportunity fund. Qualified opportunity funds can, thus, uh, can then invest in um, properties or businesses um, that are qualified within um, these opportunity zones. So this is the big opportunity for um, investors, developers, entrepreneurs in, in Lexington to try and solicit um, funding from these qualified opportunity funds. So we'll walk through um, what the various areas um, that the opportunity zones in Lexington are, um, sort of what their existing um, conditions are, and, and then kind of discuss it as a group, um, you know, any questions that you have. Anissa, did you want to go over this? Yes. So as uh, we move into what those different community profiles look like, um, last week when, or a couple of weeks ago when we spoke with community residents and folks in the neighborhood about uh, what they were going to see, we asked them to think about what they needed in those areas for those uh, areas to uh, prosper, if you will. And we asked them to write their comments in the chat. Now for you all, our investors and Dell developers, and then some community members as well, I'd like for you to either consider that first question or let us know if you have any projects currently in those areas. If you could write those down in the chat, we just wanna get more familiar with what's actually going on because the, recording, the reporting requirement for opportunity zone funds usage is not mandated anywhere. So we're hoping um, that you all will share with us any projects that you are a part of or that you know uh, that are going on within these areas. Thanks, Rob. Great. So as Anissa said, um, we created community profiles for each opportunity zone to make it easier for community members to highlight what is needed and for investors and developers to better understand the existing environment they may be potentially working in. So these profiles highlight some existing assets and neighborhoods, provide a demographic summary, and analyze vacant or underutilized properties by zoning classification. So if an opportunity fund were interested in developing residential or commercial property, they could find those, opportunity, uh, those opportunities easier and fill in vacancies. And so I'll just walk through um, each zone and just so we're all familiar, uh, with where they are. 
Um, so the first opportunity zone, uh, we kind of labeled the East Downtown Civic District. It includes portions of the North Limestone, Martin Luther King Jr., Aylesford Place, South Hill Historic, and Greater East End neighborhoods. Some of the assets we highlighted include the Public Library, Kentucky Theater, Sayre School, Lex, uh, Lextran Transit Center, the First African Baptist Church, uh, several civic buildings, including the Fayette County Attorney's Office, LFUCG offices, Fayette County District Court, and the Robert F. Stevens Courthouse Plaza, the Town Branch Commons, Thoroughbred Park, and Charles Young Park. Uh, vacant properties in this area include various levels of uh, residential or commercial zoning, and this area has the lowest level of high school graduates and service industry workers, and the highest level of residents with bachelor's, graduate, or professional degrees, and the and median home value across the seven opportunity zones. So the second opportunity zone is called the West Downtown Distillery District. This area includes the North Side, Western Suburb, and Woodyard Heights uh, neighborhoods. Some of the assets we highlighted included Rupp Arena, Central Bank Convention Center, Town Branch Park, the Explorium of Lexington, the Lexington Opera House, and Triangle Park. This area has a diversity of vacant lots that include residential, commercial, and industrial uses. It has the smallest population and fewest blue collar workers while having the highest median age, per capita income, and white collar workers across the seven opportunity zones. We call the third opportunity zone, the North University Historic District incorporates the North Limestone and Northside neighborhoods. Assets in this area include Transylvania University, Coolman Park, Dunbar Community Center, Lexington Parks and Recreation, and the Legacy Trail. Vacant lots in this area are mostly business with some industrial and uh, office uses included. This area has the highest median disposable income and median household income. The fourth opportunity zone is called the East End Residential uh, District in the guidebook and includes the North Limestone, Martin Luther King, and William Wells Brown neighborhoods. Assets in this area include Lexington Traditional Magnet School, William Wells Brown Elementary School, Lexington Community Radio, STEAM Academy, the Lexington Fire Department headquarters, the Center for Women, Children, and Families. 75% of vacant lots in this area are zoned residential with some business and industrial opportunities as well. This area has the highest black population across the seven opportunity zones. The fifth opportunity zone is called the Davis Park Red Mile District and includes the South End Park, South Hill, and Woodward Heights neighborhoods. Existing assets include the Davis Park Community Land Trust, Red Mile, and the UK Center for Drug Addiction and Alcohol Research. Industrial zoning makes up the largest vacancy in the area, uh, while some business and residential vacancies exist as well. The area has the highest number of households, uh, the largest white population, and money spent on rent, and the lowest age, uh, disposable income, household income, and net worth. We call the sixth opportunity zone, the Georgetown Street Corridor Development District, which includes the Georgetown Street and St. Martin's Village neighborhoods. Existing assets include Douglas Park, Booker T. Washington Elementary, and the Learning Center. Industrial and residential zoning make up most area vacancies, and this area has the largest population, the highest percentage of high school graduates and residents with some college education, the highest net worth and the highest percentage of service industry workers while having the lowest median home value across the seven opportunity zones. And the final opportunity zone is called the North Limestone Commercial and Innovation District and includes the North Limestone uh, neighborhood. Existing assets include BCTC, the Hope Center, North Lexington YMCA, the Health Department, Lexmark, the Legacy Trail, Whitaker Bank Ballpark, Julieta Market, Grayline Station, and WLEX 18. Uh, the vast majority of vacant properties in the district are zoned industrial, and the area has the highest percentage of residents with no high school diploma, the highest Hispanic and other uh, race populations, and the lowest number of households. So those are the uh, kind of 
opportunity zone profiles that we created in the guidebook. And now Anissa will sort of walk you through um, our conversation about community benefits agreement. Oh, Anissa, you are muted. You know, that happens for everybody at some point, Never right? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so community benefits agreements are a legally binding contract between developers and members of the community. What typically happens is there is a, a forming of a coalition of community residents. And for us, that could be um, for each of the seven areas that we discussed, or it could be one coalition that is over or uh, giving input over all of the areas altogether. Uh, but the benefit is that the community residents can indicate to developers those things in which they would like to see in the community. Uh, the example that I gave before was that uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, downtown being more or less a food desert. Like we need grocery stores in downtown Lexington and things like that. So it could be if a developer is doing a multi-use facility that um, the community would like to see in a community benefits agreement that one of those storefronts be a, um, a grocery store. And we even had clarification before that that be an affordable grocery store, not like how you stop out, you know, and you get gas and you run in the store and a bottle of water is $5. So we're not talking about that, but an affordable grocery store, just as an example. And so as we're talking with you all, um, the majority of you being investors, developers, um, those kinds of stakeholders, we want to ask you, have you worked with a community benefits agreement before and what was your experience? Rob, if you would stop sharing. Again, I'm trying to get better at this um, sitting in the awkward silence, so I am going to be quiet. Has anyone uh, worked with a community benefits agreement before and what was your experience? We'll take a couple more seconds here. This is Buddy. We we have not uh, was was really on here more just for information, informational purposes to see what you all were sharing. Okay, thank you, Buddy. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Okay, so I will share that. Um, some of the most typical things that are seen in the CBAs, if you will, community benefits agreements, have been uh, things about jobs, things about uh, affordable housing. So, for example, I uh, mentioned that when we went to Austin on the community, on the Commerce Lexington chamber trip, we went to a facility that used to be an old airport. And what they did was do uh, residential properties that are now on that site. And they had an agreement that also specified that some of those properties needed to be affordable, but they could not use uh, different supplies, if you will, than the, um, than the more costly units. So all of the units had to look the same so that you could not walk through the community and tell that this is a low income home. So things like that could be established in a community benefits agreement. In fact, anything can be established as long as the community holds it as a priority and the developer agrees to uh, meet that need that was specified by the community. The whole thing is that the community gets them what they need in order for their uh, neighborhoods and communities to uh, prosper. And then the developer on the other side basically has uh, a support group now who at least won't block, you know, like any zoning changes or things like that. So it becomes a partnership between the two and that collaboration actually makes the project go a lot smoother and better for the developer. Some other things um, that folks have said that uh, they've included have been neighborhood services. So affordable childcare and making sure that environmental safeties are, are in place when the, developer, uh, the development is underway. So those are just a few examples of some things that have been included in CBAs. And so, yes, we really just wanted to hear if you all have worked with those before and what was your uh, experience? 
Hey, you know, this, uh, oh, sorry. I, I just wanted a quick question. Um, the Eli Yusuf and I, we have the bluegrass. Um, so would, um, would like mixed use developments, um, would those be included in projects that have been funded via community benefits agreement? So like those type of projects where they include like, you know, like a grocery store at the bottom and then there's affordable house. There's like 10% of the housing is affordable housing and the other 9% are market rate. I just wonder what, what are those kinds of projects under the purview of a community benefits agreement? And if so, um, should, should there be like, like a minimum percentage of housing that would go to affordable housing? Cause I could easily see it where, only a handful of the units would be affordable. And then it's really like, are, are we really doing a, as much as we can to keep, you know, folks in the neighborhoods and not gentrified out of the neighborhoods? <clears throat> so let me say that uh, CBAs are actually, uh, they're not mandatory. So it's kind of a best practice um, that developers have. So as far as like, knowing a certain percentage or whatever, that's up for uh, the community to help establish with their CBA. So if we wanted to say even, you know, I was thinking earlier, if we wanted to say, uh, if a developer comes in, one of the things we want to see in their CBA agreement that we established with them is say 25% of their spend is with minority companies. It's all up for discussion. So, uh, but there are no mandates to use CBAs. We just know that it is the best practice and Lexington wants to be a part of that best practice, um, whatever my word is. <laughs> uh, Anissa, and if I could add to that uh, with, with CBAs as well as with Opportunity Zones funds themselves, because unless the project is gonna involve some either federal, local or state monies that might have some requirements for uh, percentages of um, affordable housing or even uh, requirements for minority business engagement. Uh, but if none of those funds are involved in an Opportunity Zone project, it would be tough, difficult to mandate those type of uh, set-asides. Thank you, Ed. All right, so we want to open it up for questions. Hello, Josh. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. I just wanted to jump in and, and say that we don't necessarily, my name is Josh Vane. I'm the executive director of the Lexington Community Land Trust. Um, and so for those that don't know about us, we don't necessarily do CBAs, but in essence, that is our model in general. Um, in a lot of ways, we act as the developer. Um, our board is configured of, of 15 individuals. Uh, five of those are required to be residents of the, the formerly Davis Bottoms, now Davis Park community. And so, you know, community control of land is really one of our guiding principles. And so um, we are a nonprofit that, that provides affordable housing. Um, I would say as some secondary missions, we also focus on anti-gentrification um, and anti-redlining. So, um, you know, we don't necessarily do CBAs, but these are all principles that, that guide the work we do here in trying to revitalize the, the Davis Park community. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi, this is Jill Embry from Balance Innovation Center. And I have a question regarding what you in your research might have seen in community agreements. Is there anything that you've seen as far as job creation and the percentage of jobs based on wages? I have not. I um, want to ask Rob, have you? I haven't seen um, specifics. Uh, um, outcomes such as that. I, th I think it's a relatively new strategy. Um, so a lot of these um, CBAs um, that I've seen at least have been within the last two or three years um, being used by uh, legislators as a way to um, sort of balance um, some of the concerns um, but while still promoting, um, you know, healthy development, so. Thank you. Hello, this is Renita. 
Uh, my understanding of community benefits agreements is, well, from the financial institution side, uh, I am an investment banker with PNC Bank. Uh, the financial institutions have a responsibility to invest in low and moderate income individuals, families, and neighborhoods. And if their rating is less than an outstanding, uh, because there are federal governments such as FDIC and Office of the Comptroller Currency that evaluates the bank's investments within these geographic areas. If the financial institution falls short of that, then the way I understand it, they are penalized with a community benefits agreement as a way to make up that shortage. PNC Bank has always received since 1977 an outstanding rating. And so as a result, we have launched a community benefits plan for $88 billion throughout our national footprint to assist those in community service development, small business development, affordable housing development. And if the specific project happens to be mentioned or referenced by residents in a respective neighborhood plan. So it is also my understanding that there does, an opportunity zone does not have to have a community benefits agreement in order to move forward. It would be helpful, but that is not a requirement. No, it, it, it certainly isn't, and, and thank you for your insights. Um, and as, as far as the Opportunity Zone program goes, um, I'm, the way that those developments happen, they're going to go through standard um, review processes by the city. There's no requirement um, for them to notify the city of projects. I think the strategy of promoting CBAs um, is just to try and find ways for the development community, the investment community, um, and, and neighborhoods and residents um, to find a more kind of positive um, way of, of, of working together. Uh, if Ed or Anissa want to add to that. I don't, but I see Ed and I see Kevin. So I was wondering if you all... I was just going to... Okay, I was just going to quickly uh, say to Ramita, but the clarification, do you say it was 88 million or that the uh, PNC it's has? 88, it's no, uh, 88 billion with a B. <clears throat> okay, with a B. And uh, is that considered part of your opp opportunity loan fund or, or does PNC have an, a fund dedicated opportunity zone investment? Uh, well, a little bit of both. PNC has created, until we hear about legislation from the federal government on the continuance of the Opportunity Zone, a PNC fund impact, impact fund, I'm sorry, PNC impact fund in lieu of the Opportunity Zone. Okay. But PNC Community Development Banking has invested and a number of opportunity zones throughout the nation. Thank you. And, and I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Yes, anything in an opportunity zone would still have to go through the, the normal planning and approval process. So you, you've got that layer, which also now, as many of you all know from the past comprehensive, plan requires more community engagement uh, as, as you get into those initial uh, stages. The other thing is, I don't want to get lost here, we're not only talking about traditional bank financing. These are investment funds that are specifically set up for opportunity zones, which is what complicates Anissa some of the time. We may not, we may have some and don't even know we, we have them uh, because they're not required uh, to report to the city. But again, it, it's a nice cooperative process. And if somebody was looking for 
uh, an incentive type structure to help their businesses, we would delve more into that. And then we would want one of these agreements, I would think, as part of that process. Thank you, both of you. Kevin, so the, instruct, the structure that you are discussing sounds similar, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Uh, Gulfstream and Owensboro, they have, cre okay. they have created uh, their own Opportunity Zone Fund with a number of investors. So that's also another structure. Sure. And I think we have Clint Edgington with um, the Nest Opportunity Fund. Clint, are you on the call? And do you want to share any uh, details or experiences working in Lexington and sort of what you all do? If he's there, I saw a message in the chat, so. Maybe not. Okay. All right, the floor is still open for any questions or comments that you all may have. Hi, this is Clint Edgington. Can you all hear me? Yep, yes, hey, Clint. we can. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I um, am traveling to Lexington today and fumbling around with Zoom in my phone. So I apologize if you hear kind of road noise over top of me. But um, yeah, we uh, I threw just some general information in the, the chats feature and we, uh, we invest in Lexington, we love Lexington. And we like how your OZ census tracks are, um, you know, are, are drawn. They seem to be like cohesive neighborhoods, which is, you know, we also invest in Columbus, Ohio. And there's some quirky census tracks up in Columbus. So like Lexington, we've we've been working here prior to OZs even being a thing. Um, and so, yeah, we've got about 30 properties. And we do, we're, we're a little bit of an oddball. We're not really kind of a developer developer. We do heavy rehab. Uh, we mostly purchase vacant properties um, that uh, aren't, aren't really inhabitable when we buy them. and. We do extremely heavy rehab and kind of bring them up, uh, you know, to their former glory. So we're not kind of a teardown type group. Um, yeah, we've, we've generally enjoyed uh, working in Lexington. I, I like the, the community a lot. I uh, got some moves today myself. And um, we've enjoyed working with uh, the city and the affordable housing group. Um, yeah, we, we, we like it. That's, I guess that's my experience. So it's, yeah. Fairly straightforward. Anything uh, I can, you, you called on me, I took a few minutes to try to fumble around to get you. Anything in particular I can shed some color on from our experience? Yeah, I'll just kind of open it up to the group. Um, this is just kind of a round table. So if anybody has questions about um, uh, for Clint too, I think uh, we, we appreciate your being here and your expertise. So if anybody um, you know, wants to ask Clint any questions too, feel free. And Rob, I, I think expertise, but happy, happy to share what I know. Sure. And Rob and Anissa, we haven't talked about him yet, but Aaron personally is on here as well. Aaron is, uh, he kind of helps the city, he leads our effort on new business recruitment. But the reason I mention him specifically right now is if you want to backtrack in his career a little bit, he was at the economic development cabinet here in the, in the state when the opportunity zone programs were put into place and the zones put into place. So if somebody is looking for kind of a historical perspective on what the thinking was at the time, uh, we probably have a pretty good resource in Aaron sitting here with us as well. Aaron, I don't know if you want to say anything about the opportunity zones, but. Well, Kevin, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yes, we were very thick in the whole, um, opportunity zone process when it came um, out from the federal government level. Um, and some of you may know, Kentucky led the way um, in a lot of areas as far as getting our website up and being ready to go when it came to opportunity zones. When we were working on it, it was still kind of coming together and what it was gonna be and how it was gonna be um, had not really been fully thought out yet. So it's great to see all the progress 
that has been made. And thanks to Ed and his team for the great work you're doing here locally uh, to move this process along uh, successfully. Don't have a great deal uh, to say about the process itself, but I'll answer any questions you have. I will say this, uh, in my former, former, former life for becoming commissioner and being in Washington, DC, uh, we didn't have CBAs, but we had a mayor in the city and I was doing uh, development and investment at that time in Washington, DC, who was focused on trying to make sure that we fought against um, gentrification across the city as DC was growing. And so the CBAs were not something we used, but it was something that we talked to developers about every time we did a new project. And it was, how can we ensure, number one, we're putting something in the community that the community actually needs. And how can we make sure that we're not building something that's gonna push people out of the community? In the 90s in Washington, DC is a quick uh, lesson of what we don't want to happen. When the um, internet boom happened in Washington, DC, a lot of investors from Virginia rushed into Washington, DC. And the prices of housing went up substantially. The problem became that somebody who bought their house in 1970 or 1980, once the new buyers came in, ended up paying more in taxes than they paid in their mortgage because the increase in the property values in their area, which eventually pushed them out into Maryland, uh, Marlboro, Maryland, to be exact. So these are things that programs like Ed and his team are doing help to guard against as we develop opportunity zones in our area and try to preserve and protect our communities. And so off my soapbox and um, the jazz go back to the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate those comments. And this and Ed, uh, Jordan Parker with Traditional Bank. I just kind of had a general question. What are some ways that that we as, as bankers can can help sort of uh, you know educate our clients, um, you know, people that we work with on you know benefits of opportunity zone, maybe even just how to define them. Is there um, is any, any comments, any uh, suggestions you would have for us, the best, best way to do that? Ed? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question, Jordan. Uh, what I think you can do if clients come to you seeking you know, investment opportunities, if they're bringing, they're looking for opportunities, then I would refer them to the guidebook that shows where there's some, some possible potential Available land that could be utilized, and uh, then financing options that that would uh, work for them. Uh, once again, it's uh, it's driven primarily uh, through tax advantages to to the developer at this point. But uh, identifying potential sites that they may be interested in, if it's in an opportunity zone, <clears throat> would be one way that uh, they could be benefited by your 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 ability to finance a project if it's in a selected zone. So then the guidebook breaks that down in pretty detail, pretty much detail on where their sites, the zoning and the opportunities that may be for investment purposes. That's a residential, commercial, even industrial. So uh, that would be one tool that you could use and direct it to it. So let me say as well, Jordan and everyone that the Opportunity Zone guide that we created, it lives on the Urban Leaks website, and that is U-L-L-E-X, so ullex.org, uh, and then you can just do a search once you get there for Opportunity Zones, but uh, we will make sure that we send that out to everyone who has registered for the session today. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Anissa. Absolutely. This is, this is Renita it, again. Have, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Anissa. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Now, um, have, at this point, it might be too premature, but has there been uh, an intentional effort to recruit, engage uh, developers who are interested in the Opportunity Zone? And how is the Lexington Opportunity Zone being marketed? One of the things that we're doing today 
as well as what we did a couple weeks ago is we're focused on the education side of things so that the community is aware that Lexington has zones, where they are, you know, what is up with an opportunity zone so that the community better understands. And then with that, what we've been able to do uh, is garner who would like to be a part of, say, a coalition for the community side, as well as see what developers are doing and how we can uh, better engage that audience as well. So a couple of weeks ago, community focus. Today is more investor and developer focus. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll have another one of these sessions where anyone who has missed the first two meetings can participate. So with that, we're just educating as well as figuring out the best ways to move forward and get people the information in which they need. Yeah, and one I will, thing I, Vanessa, if I can add just real quick, when we're talking to companies sure. or developers, uh, you know, we do talk about the opportunity zone as an opportunity uh, for them, especially if they're looking in the downtown kind of geographic area. The state also does a great job at promoting where these zones are, because that's a, where a lot of companies, a lot of developers uh, kind of make their first stop uh, pass at looking at things like this. So there is a lot of joint uh, marketing and conversation going on about it. But, uh, you know, this this effort that Anissa and Ed are leading, I think, helps us take that to another level. Yeah, and I was going to just add, uh, based on what Kevin was saying, uh, through our planning and community development efforts, when developers do come to us, uh, I have mentioned uh, the, the option of opportunity zones in some of our neighborhoods that we're, we're working in. And we've coordinated with Commerce Lexington uh, in, interested uh, developers or or investors have come through Commerce Lexington and Aaron, uh, and we've shared uh, the possibility of opportunities. And so uh, I think the discussion internally in the development community uh, has been going on and marketing effort for that to answer your question. Thank you. Mr. Woods, do you have a question? This is Roy Woods, Community Action Council. Appreciate you all, first of all, uh, just having this conversation because I've, uh, of course, met with from the city. And uh, as you know, Community Action Council has a lot of uh, families that are looking for affordable housing. And so we're trying to make sure that we really can get the correct information as we move forward. So we've talked with Jordan Park with uh, EHI consultants and so now I'm uh, having conversations with you guys and all the city is going to do as far as the ARPA funds are concerned but nevertheless we're just trying we follow all the rules and so if there is a guide book that I hear you all talking about have that knowledge so that we know exactly where we're because while we have some funds we still need additional funds based on the statistics that the city has put out there there are a number of families particularly homeless families that are in need of housing and so that's one of our goals is to try to provide that type of housing for homeless families not individuals but people who that actually have you know kids with them and so at county public schools we find that that there are a number of children that are out there that couches and sleeping in cars and things of that nature. So we're just trying to find out what some of the rules are. So any information that you all can share with us at Community Action Council is very helpful. So we appreciate you all. Thank you, Roy. Questions, comment? Hi, this is Chilambri again. Um, I know yes. that the state has an Opportunity Zone website that has projects listed that are either looking for funding or um, partnerships. Is there a Lexington-based um, similar site that you're aware of that would have um, projects listed, or do you know how often the state one is updated? I don't know if Lexington has one, but one of the things that we talked about in that guidebook is the need for such a database. Um, and if you go to look for the guidebook on our website, and this is a shameless plug, we do have direct links to those various sites that we know about. So you can find those there. Okay. And Ed? 
I, I'm not aware of any. I was going to say if Kevin uh, through the city or Commerce Lexington might uh, be aware, but I, I'm not aware of any at this time. Yeah, I'm not aware of any either as well. Ed. Thank you. All right, this is my uh, next to last uh, request for questions or comments. All right, so as we start to wind down the conversation, please know that if you do have additional questions, comments, concerns, or whatever, we do ask that you would just go ahead and shoot me an email. Uh, most of you have received my email address through uh, receiving the link for today's meeting. Or if you did not receive it that way and you were in direct contact with Ed or with Rod, feel free to shoot them uh, your question as well, and we will do our best to get back with you. If there is additional information that, that we can provide outside of sending you all the uh, guidebook and other information, please let us know, and we'll try to get that information to you as quickly as possible. All right. Anissa? Aaron? Yeah. I just would have one one more thing to say publicly. Sure. Uh, I want to thank you, Anissa, Ed, and your team for all the great work that you're doing on the Opportunity Zones. I think that having the different players involved in these conversations makes a great difference in how we move forward. So I thank you guys for having the foresight and the thought to include the community, to include developers and investors in this conversation as we try to make these Opportunity Zones the best they can be for our overall community. So thank you all very much for all your help and for all the hard work you put into making this uh, an excellent project for the city. So thank you. Thank you, we appreciate that. Uh, I know uh, we've had the support of, of, of Kevin and uh, the city and, uh, and, and really the board, Kevin's board has been really supportive of this process and Commerce Lexington as well has been very, uh, you know, instrumental in this. And then I, I want to recognize Rob, who has the technical expertise to put together the, the maps and knowledge. He probably knows more data about Lexington to be a Louisville person. He is uh, quite knowledgeable on areas where there are potential investments. So uh, thank everyone. You know, Ed, I just want to echo that because what Rob did was we, t we talked early on in this process that some cities were going about trying to put together a prospectus on their on their zones. What he did was started it into the data dive and ended up with one of the best perspectives without calling it that, you know, without calling it a prospectus. I think that any, and if you can go in this thing, especially where he's got it highlighted by sections, you can really tell what that particular kind of few blocks is all about. And it really helps as an investor taking a look at how can I come in and, and be a part of that part of the, you know, within that community. So, Rob, hats off to you. You've just you work excellent work. Just excellent Appreciate work. that. Thank you. It was great working with you all on this. All right. Thank you all. And I look forward to giving you back, what, about 30, 40 minutes of your time. Enjoy your afternoon. If you want to join the next conversation, it will be on February the 8th, again at 12 o'clock. You can use the same link in which you uh, access today in order to access that meeting. However, we do want uh, people to register for the meeting so that if we do send out additional materials that will have your, um, your, your email address and things along that line. So again, Thank you all for participating today. Thank you team for being here as well and answering questions. I appreciate it. Thanks, Anissa, you did a great job. Bye everybody, thanks. Take care everybody. Bye.